This video will round out our discussion of literary theories, which is laying the groundwork for the big final paper, um, which is going to be quite the doozy. Um, feminism. <clears throat> feminism is a theory that has attracted so much negative attention lately, which is strange because like most of my training in literature was um, had such a positive and like you know open and almost loving view of feminism as a social force. But a lot of people throw around the term feminism and they don't really know what it means or where it came from or how it should realistically be applied. Um, we're going to talk about liter we're going to talk about feminism from a literary perspective, obviously because this is a literature class. But um, you can't really talk about feminism without going into a little bit of sociology as well. Um, because ultimately feminism is the, uh, the execution of a complex set of um, rules and observations about how society itself works and how those things can be found and explored and sometimes even, you know, combated. Now, <sighs> feminism is predicated on this basic idea, shocker, the, that for the majority of human history, Women were oppressed, and quite heavily oppressed. And society had a lot of constructs within it that was designed to further that oppression. You really can't debate that. I mean, from the historical standpoint, women in Western civilization have had a pretty bad go of it. Um, it took a long time in America for women to earn the right to vote. It took a long time for women to not be viewed as property, basically. Um, this is going to be really important when we start talking about the works of Chopin. Um, but literary feminism, well, before I get into literary feminism, sociological feminism looks at how to empower women. And one of the things that you have to do in order to empower women is to identify the structures that are put in place to keep women down or to keep them oppressed. One of the, one of the more controversial elements of feminism is its kind of odd relationship with religion. Um, the, uh, the thinker Simone de Beauvoir, who was you know, a French thinker, she was big and instrumental in this because there's, there's a lot of atheism associated with feminism because especially in Western civilization, religions have, been, have had a really nasty habit of being patriarchal. Um, meaning that they are led primarily by male figures. There is a male God. There is, like, you know, there's statements in the Bible that feminists find very unfortunate. Um, I think there's one where it's like, you know, a woman is supposed to read the Bible with her eyes closed. Um, and uh, statements about women being in charge. Uh, the fact is, like, there's, there's parts where there's a judgment called down because women took on more leadership roles, whereas the Bible doesn't really look too favorably upon that. Um, for a feminist, this is, this is a huge problem. But there's other places where women are subjected to um, very odd standards that identify the fact that we live in a patriarchal society even still. It's not as bad, obviously, as it used to be, but there are still kind of elements to that. Um, the overrepresentation of males in government the overrepresentation of men in in CEO positions. Um, these are all things that are you know ripe for discussion, and th from a literary perspective, you can see a lot of interesting stuff when you're looking at it from a feminist perspective. And a feminist is basically going to look for themes or evidence of female oppression. And feminism can take approaches not just identifying the empowerment of women in text, which you see a lot in modern literature where women struggle simply because they are women, but before that, think about the minister's black veil. Are women in that story are kind of relegated to the wayside. It's actually kind of a big deal that Hooper, the Reverend Hooper, is left by his fiance. She leaves him. That in itself is kind of a big deal. Um, Katrina Van Tassel, she's a prize for Ichabod. Lygia, 
I don't know what the hell why she is, honestly. I don't even know how to begin to approach that. But one of the best ways to illustrate feminism, and it's really kind of pointed criticism of modern culture, is with something that is called, and I absolutely love this, the Smurfette Principle. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Smurfs. The Smurfette Principle is fascinating, because when you see, what, when you see it, it's hard to unsee it. Basically, the Smurfette principle is based upon the character Smurfette and the fact that Smurfette is simply a female Smurf. That is the thing that distinguishes her. That is the key to her identity. And like, what is it that makes her female? Long hair and long eyelashes. The Smurfette principle basically states that the central character in most, in most media, especially children's media, is going to be male. He is the center, he is the focus, right? When we have a female character introduced, there is a very, very creepy pattern that the female is simply an altered version of the male. Look at Minnie Mouse. Minnie Mouse and Mickey Mouse are carbon copies of each other, but Minnie has a bow and a dress. And long eyelashes and a high voice. Higher than Mickey, which is, you know, frightening because Mickey already sounds like a deflating balloon, right? So, and same thing with Daisy. Like, you have Donald Duck and Daisy Duck. Daisy is simply a carbon copy of Donald with a bow. That really repeats itself in a lot of children's media to the point that a lot of feminists believe this is an example of female oppression because females are basically relegated to sub-males. They are still the male character, just slightly modified. Um, and lots of times in these types of shows, you don't see much female centrality. Women are never the focus of these shows. It's almost always the male. Um, there's been a big effort in the past few years to produce children's media that is more gender-balanced. Now, the funny thing is, is where you start to kind of rub people the wrong way with feminism and where people start to get angry about it is when we start mandating changes to behavior. Um, where we start saying we need more of these types of characters, we need to have less of this. That does have a tendency to step on the toes of free speech. Um, so, in that case, the anger that it draws out is a little bit more understandable. And where it starts to get visceral is when you start talking about female representation in comic books and female representation in video games. You are opening a huge can of worms when you start talking about that because, unfortunately, video games and comic books have big, big problems when it comes to feminism and female representation. Look at Mario. I know, the innocent little... I bet you guys thought I was going to go straight to Grand Theft Auto, weren't you? No, I'm going to talk about... It's -a me, Mario! Mario has a counterpart in Princess Peach... But for the most part, except for in a few games, Peach is the prize to be won. She has to be rescued from Bowser. She is the end goal. This is the idea of the damsel in distress. This is actually kind of problematic because Mario is the acting central force and Peach in this case has been relegated to a reward slot. She's a prize to be won. That's actually kind of, in my opinion, a little sexist. I mean, for that pattern to per continuously perpetuate itself the way that it does, it's a bit problematic. I'm not going to go so far as to say, we must change Mario. And there does seem to be at least some effort to these changes. Um, there have been games where Peach has been a playable character. Super Mario 2, although Super Mario 2 wasn't even a Mario game. Look that up. That'll blow your mind. Um... Any of the games where it's Mario Party, Mario Tennis, but in those cases, those, those aren't actual Mario games, right? It's always that central Mario character. We haven't even gotten into the fact that female superheroes, their dress, their costumes are sexualized to absolute hell. Um, the, the armor... I mean, it's so simple. Just look up a picture of uh, the game Soul Calibur and look at the armor the women wear in that game. Like, it... I mean, I'm not a prude or anything, but good lord, man. That's not effective battle gear. Like, what, why do we do this? 
Um, the anatomical problems, the posing of comic book characters, sometimes Catwoman and Wonder Woman bend in a way that it's obvious that the artist is trying to depict their rear so that it occupies most of the panel. And it's like, if a woman actually bent like that, her spine would just shatter. Like, this is, this is like, completely unrealistic anatomy. And the question then becomes is that, in this case, feminism is coming right up to, speech, to free speech, and there is a conflict. Because if we're going to mandate or even encourage inclusion, at what point does a person's free speech trump their need to be inclusive and tolerant? right? And understanding and empathetic. These are good questions. And so as we move forward, one of the things that you can do as you analyze literature is to think to yourself, where is the, the female figure? Is, is she there? Is she missing? Is this indicative of oppression? Are women being relegated to the sidelines? Are they being treated as objects? And what does this tell us about society? If it's in a modern context, is the depiction of a woman in this case true? Is it accurate or is it somehow inaccurate? All of these things are good to go from a feminist perspective. You definitely are getting into a contentious field. But that's part of the fun of literature. Whereas math is all about plus signs and numbers and division symbols, we get to talk about stuff that hurts. We talk about stuff that's painful and is difficult. And I would, I would invite you to embrace that. Coming soon, the assignment description for paper three. And finally, some Walt Whitman. Ah! <laughs>